So here's the question. In the print and packaging supply chain, how do we deliver new ideas and innovative practices to continually improve your profit, your brand, and your quality? Welcome to the Gamut Podcast, and I am your host, Jeff Collins, Director of Print Technologies for ID Alliance. We are a nonprofit global think tank serving the graphic communications industry with 12 offices strategically located around the world to better support our membership. You can support the Gamut Podcast and content like this by becoming a member at ID Alliance by going to www.idalliance.org. I would also like to thank Konica Minolta for sponsoring this podcast. They are a world leader in industrial and commercial printing and packaging solutions. With a comprehensive portfolio of production print offerings, Konica Minolta delivers the latest innovations in printing, applications, and expertise. On today's Gamut Podcast, we are speaking with Jason Campbell of x Right. Jason came into the print industry at a time when conventional analog processes began migrating to digital. He started his career at Daytimers, a print manufacturer of calendars and time management products, where he spent 16 years modernizing and automating the entire production workflow from design to print. Jason joined x Ray in 2015 as a solution architect focused on packaging. He has a broad background in color management, software development, workflow design, and IT, which serves him well in a unique role as a conduit between customer support, product management, and research and development. He holds a degree in computer science from Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Hey, Jason, how are you today? Welcome to the Gamut Podcast, and we appreciate you hanging out with us today. Awesome, awesome, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Jason, and we're happy to have you as well. And we talked before several times, and you are now with x right You've been there since, I believe, uh, 2014, 2015. And why don't you tell us about your role there at x right as well as your background, your story in the print industry? Yeah, so uh, I came on in about 2015 uh, into a solution architect role focused on print and packaging, um, very fitting work chatting. Uh, and really the, the core piece of the entire role is helping customers use our solutions, uh, implement best practices and help them be more successful in the job we all know we're all challenged with between design, production, print. Um, and uh, it's been really, really interesting kind of working for the mothership, so to speak. Now, you came on board with x right after the um, partnership or merger between x right and Pantone. So tell us a little bit about that relationship. How frequently do you guys collaborate on projects? Uh, more and more, actually. Uh, I think in the beginning, it really was sort of uh, a combined entity. However, there was still that arm's length reach. Um, you know, it's like the, the brother you don't see every day type of a, a thing, but you're mm -hmm. still relations. And the relationship has grown, I think, more over the last few years, at least from my point of view. Um, and I actually live very close to the Pantone office. So I've been engaged with them more and more. And, you know, they're, they have the same challenges that any other printer has. So, of course, you know, we work very closely to make sure that we are implementing, uh, you know, best practices there. And, um, you know, my sayings, you know, eat your own dog food. Right. So uh, if I go out to a customer and say you should be measuring, use digital standards, do this, do this, you know, let's make sure we're applying that internally so that we're delivering the best product for our Pantone customers as well. You have an interesting background, having been trained and educated, and you have a degree in computer science. So that's just very, well, actually, it's very common uh, with a lot of the people in the print industry that I interview on the Gamut podcast and come across and know they typically have a background or an education. Yeah, well, computer really science is kind of a funky one because, you know, there's not really a prescription. You know, if you go to medical school, you're going to be a doctor. And if you specialize and you go into neurosurgery, you're going to 
you know, be dealing with some brains. So, you know, computer science, though, really is far flung, you know, left, right and center in terms of anything to deal with computer technology. Um, and that could be hardware, software and, and everything in between. So there was never really any prescribed direction uh, that was going to say, well, this is what you're going to do and and the window and the box that you're going to fit in. And with respect to the print work, I can't tell you how many colleagues I've talked to over the years that, you know, you have a couple of beers and you're talking to each other and you realize, how did we end up in this business? Um, I don't think anyone ever grows up and goes, you know, I want to be a print provider or uh, I'd like to separate color. Um, and yet here we are with the diversity that that's around this industry. And for me, it started early on, um, probably back in junior high when they taught graphic arts. Uh, you know, we had a big guillotine cutter and AB Dick press and a camera and you'd strip film and shoot plates and, you know, do the yeah. whole operation the way that I think a lot of us cut our teeth on, at least if you came into the business over, you know, say 25, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, from that, then that just really kind of hung on and went through college and still, you know, I went to, to Lehigh, which is here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and doing computer science, but modernized and took, you know, a manual paste up workflow for our school newspaper and implemented Quark Express. And then we weren't, you know, delivering right. wax up, we were delivering PDF. So it really just was this thread that continued throughout. That's cool, man. So Lehigh University and PA, I'm from Maryland, so I, I get up, I uh, used to get up to uh, PA quite often, uh, skiing and uh, Blue Knob. You ever heard of Blue Knob? It's great. Uh, I think is I don't know if that's south, but, uh, you know, up our way is a little bit more middle, uh, I would say middle eastern side of Pennsylvania. Right, right. And and some might challenge the terminology skiing as it applies to Pennsylvania mountains, but uh, <laughs> we make do with what we get. More like skating. I mean, for listeners that haven't skied the East Coast, it's uh, a lot of ice in the wintertime there. That's right. It's a combination of, uh, it's, it's skleeting. It's, it's a, a combination of skating and skiing, I believe. Skleeting, yes. That's a better term. So, Jason, I've been dying to ask this question. Uh, we talked about it before, and it's something that comes up quite frequently in the print industry when we're trying to maintain color consistency and accuracy and meet that uh, designer's intent or brand uh, intent, color, brand management, that kind of thing. So why don't my Pantone colors match? It's a, it's a common question. Why? What, what's why? the deal? <laughs> <laughs> if it was only so easy, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry, man. Um, you know, we try to make it easy, but you know, you know, this is this is what we all I think everybody in the educational uh, consulting side of our industry um, really kind of summarizes it into. We all have our focuses, and so those on the design side and those that are focused on putting color together in a design intent and trying to create an image, the focus is not on all the technical minutia that somebody like myself, my colleagues, our colleagues focus on. Um, they don't necessarily know what a spectrophotometer is or you know what spectral bands are typical from an instrument and how that works with software. And they, they understand design goals and design intent and they have a, a, a style guide they put together. Um, and that doesn't necessarily always take into account you know, what the reality is going to be when it leaves them and becomes something in the production stream. Right. So getting back to that question, um, there's, you know, really uh, ways that you can ensure that the color, your spot color or your Pantone swatch will not I'm, I'd say, again, will not uh, uh, match uh, if you're sending that file to a variety of different uh, printing processes or print service providers. So, for instance, we you know, typically would advise a uh, creative, maybe a brand owner, 
that they you know keep those Pantone swatches uh, as fifth and sixth colors, as opposed to converting them to CMYK. Yeah, I mean that's so. There, there's really two topics that come out of out of this umbrella uh, of making colors match. The the one is what the expectation is, and the other one is what's achievable. Uh, right. I, I couldn't tell you how much time proportionally I spend talking to um, customers, colleagues uh, about this, where we have a design intent. And as you put it, whether it originates as a spot color or is already a, a, a pre, uh, pre-converted build, that might be my expectation. Um, so a designer goes and they print to their, you know, maybe they have a a fiery rip or they've got, you know, some color printer. Uh, They might have their Pantone fan deck. This is, this is the grounds of expectations. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is where they go. I really am inspired by this color. Right. Uh, And we'll talk more about that later, but you know, it's sort of what is a fan deck and what isn't it. And it's number one tool in life is design inspiration. So they identify that color and go, this, I really love this. You build your brand program, you build your identity, whatever, whatever your design intent is. And you send that out into the world. And then it might be, but I'm going to print that on a brown box. Well, I'm going to tell you that that yellow Pantone color is not probably going to come out the way that you're looking for it uh, because it's just not achievable. It's not achievable when you get to the actual end result. Well, the brown box was an excellent uh, example. And as uh, simple as it may sound uh, to people that are in the print industry, whether you're a press operator or you're in pre-press or you're you know, a color management guru, um, it may sound simple that, oh, yeah, of course the substrate will change that color, but that's not always the expectation uh, way up front in the creative design stage. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've also talked to different um, PMAs, you know, different pre-media companies that uh, or even printers that have their own graphics departments, um, you know, there's usually a preference in, as uh, you put it very well, do you maintain a fifth or sixth channel where you have a separation that's spec as, say, a Pantone color or a brand identity equity color, or do you pre-convert it? Um, and those are really critical decisions that seem like, well, I'm just an illustrator. I'm just going to, you know, click the little, that little icon there and kick it into a build. You just made a very significant decision to do that even though it seems so innocuous at the time, the results through the printing process and the workflows that will come after your design is released, you know, really, you know, cast a, a far, a far and wide set of variables that now it's like, choose your own adventure. <laughs> right. Is it going to be formulated? Will, will it be a build? Is it four color? Is it seven color? Um, under what print conditions? What print processes? You know, these are these are all tremendous variables that affect what that achievability is. Understood. And, uh, you know, it, the design intent uh obviously doesn't match the uh, production reality. How do we help solve that problem? And many, you know, brand owners, possibly, you know, art directors, designers, I don't care how it gets done, guys, downstream. <laughs> right. this, is the, uh, this is the file. This is our, you know, Pantone. Here's, here's my Pantone here. chip. Here's my Pantone <laughs> the, the, chip. Here's my physical, the, fr- from my book, on, on right. my desk that might be, you know, <laughs> We don't know how old it is. Has it been left in the sun? You know, but it's this is this is what inspired me, and this is what I want to hold you to. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't tell you how many times that that I I, I hear that from um, you know print uh, from converters, print suppliers, that they go, you know, hey, the pie in the sky, yeah, that it should just be a Pantone color, it should just be a digital standard. But then somebody goes, yeah, yeah, but this is this is my chip. And I'm going to come for a press check and, and this is what I'm holding you to. It's like, but, but wait, you know, and then on the other hand, we have brand owners that we see today, you know, with uh, the efforts of ID Alliance, with the efforts of x Right and Pantone and other other industry uh, affiliates and members PMAs that, too, yeah. 
you, you know, we we all get then the feedback from the brand side going, oh, we have all this on shelf variation. Oh, okay. I, oh, I see oh well, <laughs> well, let's talk about this. So you 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 contract your print providing from um, I believe a hundred different print suppliers globally, and how are you distributing those color standards? We just call out a Pantone color. Uh, okay, and and is there any auditing done on are they using a digital standard against Pantone? Um, and this goes for brand equity color, Jeff. I, I just yeah. want to call that out. You know, we kind of focus on Pantone as it's so ubiquitous in our our vernacular yeah, here in, sure. in the industry. But I, but even if it, you know a brand red, for example, Kellogg's red, uh, Coke red. The you know the you know the one of the the most commonly uh, cited examples out there. Um, when that's communicated, you know, the the ideal is I'm getting a digital standard, something that's unmoving. It doesn't fade. It's weather resistant. Um, it's, it's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get translated, um, in any way it, it's very stable. And so when we provide digital standards throughout the workflow, um, you know, that is the most stable way to communicate color. And the answer to your question from a minute ago, um, is, you know, how do I how do I get a stable, you know, print process? Communication, uh, communication in terms of what your intent is, communication about what the print process will be. If you know, I know that's not always known at design time. Yeah, and then certainly from the print providers, absolutely. You know, I, the old saying of the customer is always right. I think has led a lot of the print providers to just you know nod their heads and go, yes, I'll just match this. But the way that the industry is moving right now, especially with those challenges I noted from our brand partners, is we don't want that on-shelf instability. We want brand brand look, brand equity, consistency. And so, therefore, there needs to be a pushback sometimes to say, hey, um, I know you really wanted this yellow, but we, I can't help but notice we're going to be printing some brown craft boxes for you with this design. Um, you are aware that this yellow is not achievable um, unless we do like white lay down first or move to a model white or, you know, we, uh, yeah. what's more important, the brown box or your design intent. And we need to communicate to manage that expectation. You know, it does say guide on that fan deck. And I think that a lot of people consider it uh, the Bible and don't understand how quite that is supposed to be used. The fan deck. Z the uh, the thing that I think that we run into is, um, you know, there's I don't know if it's a matter of expectation, assumption, or perhaps just a matter of communication. But the way I typically put it with customers is, what is a Pantone guide and what isn't it? Right. Um, it it is not a reference. It's a guide. Um, and if you talk to some of our tenured Pantone uh, teammates, they would very much tip, tell you that those printed guides, you know, hey, it's a print process, Jeff. You know, we print that on a, on a lithographic press using paste ink. And that's a far cry from, you know, water-based flexo on brown craft and uh, solvent-based reverse clear back by white on film, um, you know, but it's there for design inspiration. That was its original inception back in, I believe it was 1963, I want to say, if I've got my company history right. Um, and the idea was, okay, let's create a, a stable environment to try to verbally communicate color with some specificity. If I say Pantone 180C, Mm -hmm. I believe many of the listeners to this podcast would go, ah, and they could grab that fan deck, whip it out, and they know what we're talking about. And they have a good concept of what are we, what are we, or is it a brown, a green, a blue, a gray? It's a red. Um, exactly. Uh, but you know that because of that guidebook. <laughs> That's right. And however, there's a big difference between, there's a big difference between whether that is the universal meaning of Pantone 180C, or is that a 
representation to help inspire design. And I think that that's really the crux of the matter. Uh, and at, at Pantone and X-Rite, you know, we've been working uh, with some of our solutions to address those things um, to make digital standards more obtainable to various software and solutions throughout the workflow from design to to QC out the, the back end of a press, uh, ink formulation and everything to try to help stabilize what that original customer expectation was um, right. to sort of end the, the ambiguity of, well, did they mean my, my 180C in my book or did they, did they mean something from a chip that they provided me? Right. There's still all that ambiguity even though we think we're being specific. Now, there are a lot of leading brands that are, you know, very good at communicating what their requirements are. For Indeed. Pantone colors and uh, a lot of the time we see them moving from the, uh, you know, analog uh, technology. So your commercial offset, you know, running a spot ink, they can get the ink formulation, they can tell the print service provider it was exactly uh, what that uh, color should be, the Delta E, et cetera. However, there seems to be a little bit of a challenge and an uneasy feeling when they're looking at capitalizing on digital short run CMYK devices that all have a wide variety of, you know, d dynamic ranges, you know, color gamut. Uh, the overprints are different, and then they need to apply, you know, on these particular devices, ICC profiling, et cetera. And they ask, you know, what should we do in this situation? Should we give them the same information, the same file that we would give our Flexo printer? And uh, should we convert it into CMYK builds? So can you provide any advice on, you know, that, uh, you know, why should builds be specified or should they not when we're going into those environments that I mentioned? Yeah, let's absolutely, uh, we could shift focus real easily to that. So, you know, I think we've, we've set a nice foundation of, you know, communication. We want to communicate what our design intent is. And that goes for whether it's, you know, remains a formulated ink, a spot ink, if you will, uh, or process. And that by process, I just want to be clear that I'll speak holistically four color or seven color, you know, yeah. expanded gamut, there which has certainly been growing at a tremendous rate over the last few years. Um, and when we get into digital, you're absolutely right. You know, the systems are generally all anywhere from four, five, six, seven color units. Um, and we have to convert them into process. We right. have to do that or we can't achieve it. There is no Pantone 180C per se on as a deck on the digital press. Um, some might accommodate that, but that's not typical. And so usually it's, again, it comes down to what the process up front and the prep work on the art is going to be. So usually if a designer has their channel maintained as a Pantone 180C, since that seems to be our little example we're using, um, you know, they might have black type, they might have other contone art that's either RGB or, you know, maybe they've already converted to CMYK, but typically RGB. And then you've got that spot channel um, happening. And usually when you go through the workflow, whether it be proofing or obviously going to um, plate, if you're going to do conventional process or a digital press, the software, the DFEs, the front ends, the digital front ends for these systems will have the profile of that device and that substrate and that ink system, which are really the three big variables that control right. that achievability and give you a sense of, first off, what is the right build? Um, so to answer your other question is, should I give somebody a build? I don't really recommend it unless you've got very clear uh, provenance to what that build is based on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is the context of that build? Was it, 
was it the same ink system with the same plates on the same substrate, you know, done to a G7 spec? And yeah. otherwise, my build is even just a little bit off from yours. And that can greatly affect what the result is going to be when printed. And so again, same thing with, you know, my proofer is not your proofer. My profile is not your profile. So if I pre-separate to CMYK or CMYK OGV and provide that file to you, you know, Mr. Collins, my print provider, uh, I may not get the same expectation that I saw on my proofer with that bill. So I want to talk to you about something you mentioned earlier, uh, CMYK OGV, and we've done several podcasts. We're doing a lot of work with ID Alliance on, you know, uh, best practices and standardizing, uh, you know, uh, seven color process working with guys like Mark Samworth. Mark's been on the podcast. So can you talk to us about seven color process, CMYK OGV? You guys have, uh, 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 Pantone guides for that, and you definitely have a history in this space, you know, working with Hexachrome. Yeah, I mean, historically, Pantone uh, was developing a six color model, obviously, Hexachrome. Uh, and really, what's kind of happened over time, and, and before that, you had Jack Frank on from West Rock yes. MPS, uh, who is also a, a, a colleague and, and associate of mine. Um, and we were just recently talking about, and I think he mentioned on your podcast that historically they had some, you know, ECG techniques mm -hmm. with his organization, um, but it was very um, trial and error. Yeah. Uh, Hexachrome. And when that all came out, I, I want to say that must have been maybe the late 80s, early 90s, uh, that that was where color science was getting involved. And then that really manifested much more when seven color, when it stepped up to seven color and you look at uh, the first guidelines and, and ECG and the work that's being done now and really uh, accelerating in terms of the efforts uh, and analysis and, and input being given there, where it is much more based in color science. Um, there is actually, you know, could sit there and get, get a whiteboard out and show you the math. Mm -hmm. uh, back to why is it OGV? Uh, what, what is this helping me do? And if anybody out there has ever seen, or you sit there and Google it, um, a gamut plot for CMYK, uh, and I think even ID Alliance has some of that in the educational materials around um, process print G7, when you see the OGV get added, it bumps out uh, the achievable colors, especially in places that are very hard to achieve in subtractive color meaning CMYK. Right. And so somebody gets like a bright green in their design intent. Um, you're going to have a really challenging time uh, hitting that in any combination of yellow and cyan. But when I incorporate a, you know, a single pigment green ink, green colorant mm -hmm. to the equation, um, suddenly now I can do things chemically that I couldn't do mathematically right and now suddenly makes the math work and I can now separate color into using additional colorants that I you know was limited before right now I don't want to forget um, something that we talked about it with the fandex and uh, you know being used as uh, a reference versus a guide and we used to have hexachrome guides uh in production when we were doing uh six color and then our six color process similar to the color bridge and now pantone also has an extended color gamut uh fan deck uh that's again used similar to the color bridge so uh explain to our listeners uh those two guides and um the benefits of using them yeah, so, you know, this is just like earlier on when I was calling out the fact that these guides are really originally intended as a design inspiration and they become used as a reference point uh, by so many. Um, the color bridge and the ECG guide really fit two slightly different angles of that, which is 
we all have our solid coded guides and uncoded guides. That's what people think of as the quintessential Pantone fan deck, Pantone guide. And what we've done with the color bridge and with the ECG guide is said, okay, if I go ahead and convert that spot color, just as we talked about for the last several minutes, into four color or into seven color ECG, what might my results be? Now, of course, that's based on the the process used on an offset press and you know all the achievability things we talked about at the beginning of the session today. But it gives a designer and procurement and brand team uh, a good reference point to say, is my spot color that I would normally ask for as a spot, as a formulated ink, a fifth ink, a sixth ink, whatever it may be, is it a good candidate to switch in a four color or seven color? Right. Uh, because you know, so many of us are like, I'll know it when I see it. Okay, well, I, I just finished telling you, well, you you may have to give up two delta E at best. That's the mm -hmm. best match you're going to get. Okay, well, what's that look like? So my Pantone 180C, if I turn that in a four color and I turn that in a seven color, what might that change actually look like? And am I okay with it? Yeah. And that's what those perfect. tools really help, uh, you know, address. Makes perfect sense. I could see, I can see people using them both and making a decision right now. No, I can still hit that with CMYK. It's accurate enough. Don't need to separate it into seven color process. Right. Or, you know, you get some of these really crazy out there colors in, mm -hmm. in the Pantone space. And you look at what they might turn into in four color and you go, okay, that's not going to be the way we're going to go with that one that's because that is way too far away and a bridge too far. Right. And yet in seven color, wow, you know, in seven color, because of that orange, green and violet being in the mix and that gamut expansion. Yeah. Very much its namesake. Uh, now, all of a sudden, well, that that green actually looks really good in seven color. We could do that instead of ordering a spot ink. Uh, just as important, right? Either way, one's you know possibly more economical. The other one is going to differentiate your brand, and that's more important. Or you know, there's so many possibilities around that little scenario there. But going back to hexachrome, there seem to be um, only a handful of commercial printers that could really uh, do uh, extended color gamut printing. You know, or seven color, six color process hexachrome or hi-fi color, whatever you want to call it. But there uh, was a lack of adoption. And nowadays, uh, what we see is continued. It's really a trend in adopting this uh, due to the economic benefits. And it's not just for you know a handful of printers. It's uh, being adopted by uh, large and small commercial print service providers. Absolutely. I mean, the the benefits are varied. Uh, and by varied, I mean, in terms of magnitude. So I've worked with printers that certainly would love to build their ECG business. Um, they've even built it up enough to where certain plants have some presses that live set up on a on a fixed pallet. Right. Um, fixed pallet being kind of our, our other terminology for ECG that some people might be familiar with, meaning I have those seven colors and that's all I'm loading. If you want spot colors, it's not going on that press. Um, and digital, obviously, as we said, the system necessitates it. Um, and so the other factor is when you get into mixed designs that contain a multitude of spot colors, there are two things that often work against you uh, as a designer. Um, one is you have to decide how many colors you even can pick from. So you might want to explore lots of colors, but there's not a lot of 15 color presses out there. Right. So if your design palette is 15 colors, you, you've got some challenges in front of you when it comes time for procurement to talk to your print suppliers. The other aspect, of course, is cost. 
um, because I'm sure if somebody out there has a 15 color press, you're going to be paying for that. But if we go to if we can convert that effectively to seven color, that becomes very economical, both for the customer and for the printer. And so it's a very symbiotic direction um, for color reproduction to go down. Now, of course, one of the big caveats from a brand or, or designer aspect is, but what is my expectation? If that's you know the the Kellogg's red, the Coke red, you know right. a brand equity color, am I willing to accept some variation because not all of those previously formulated colors can be achieved? even in seven color process. Right. And, then, and so there's still yeah. that same little bit of trade off uh, as to, okay, do the ends justify the means? Oh, I can run a lot more diff uh, design variation and that's very valuable to my campaign, my brand campaign. And it's also really economical. So our budget and our advertising budget works, our design goals work. Okay, but we need to give up the fact that my equity color can only get matched within about a delta E of two to the otherwise formulated digital spec if I was printing that as a, maintaining it as a spot color. Right. So there's little bits of trade trade offs there, but those are the kind of things that uh, you know people out there in in podcast land listening you know would have to grapple with is you know there's a, a nexus between design intent goals cost achievability and acceptance well said so jason i want to talk to you about an area that you're an expert in or definitely uh have a lot of experience and you often advise customers on this particular issue and that's dealing with coating and lamination and how it shifts or affects color. Often we have uh, designers, uh, printers, uh, where their expectations are set and they don't take into consideration coating and lamination and finishing processes, especially in Flexo. Oh, yeah, because especially, as I said, with Flexo, you figure that the majority of time, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to wedge ink between two laminated pieces of film. So we print reverse, back it by clear, generate our color. You know, the surface is super durable because it's behind plastic. And then the backside of it, well, I don't want to be touching my food or, you know, maybe I've got to even metalize it. Think of, you know, the chip bag, potato chip bag. You open that up, it's foil inside. Well, I didn't print on the foil per se. I printed on clear film and then glued it to the foil. Um, there I say glue, you know, I laminated it to the foil mm -hmm. and you know, the color will shift. Now I've got this gray background through a thin coating of white ink with a thin coating of color through some thickness, uh, clear film. And the thicker that gets, the bluer it often gets, or possibly yellow, depending on the, the type of film. So now I've just taken all those variables we just talked about, and now I've added like three more, four more, and hoping that when I stick it all together, that I hit that customer expectation for on-shelf color. And that's often what we say is, I'm targeting shelf color. Right. That's what the customer wants. They're, they're, they don't buy color bars. They don't buy pre-laminated targets. They buy laminated slit rolls to go to their you know, uh, their co-packer to put product in it, put it on a shelf for customers to buy. And that whole act of doing that changes color quite a bit. And the, the, the real brutal part of it from a technology standpoint is it doesn't do so in any kind of linear fashion. So well, a so blue will shift different yeah. than a red or a purple or a green. Right. Um, process will shift different than formulated ink. And even in some of the research and work that, that I've been part of, um, different ink series with the same press, same materials, same process, same ex extradit lamination, all those things being held constant, but switch ink systems, they vary. Right. So right. <laughs> it's a heck of a challenge. It really, really is probably one of the toughest things for in the flexibles uh, uh print provider market to manage. Right. And what about coding when we're talking about, you know, UV coding and different uh, 
environmental friend, friendly coatings. Uh, how often is that, you know, where's the expectation? Is it as severe as what you're talking about with lamination? Certainly not as severe. Uh, usually it's less severe and a little bit more predictable. Um, more often than not, the appearance factor, if you were describing to somebody going, well, what's the difference? Uh, if I just took, you know, a nice coated offset sheet that was not aqueous coated or UV coated against one that was, you often find that the color is brighter. It's more chromatic. Yeah. Uh, I may get a hue shift, but typically the appearance is it's lighter and it's more chromatic from that, that coating. But that has to all be taken into account when that, especially if it's a formulated ink, that you know the ink room is taking that into their formulation to know, okay, this is what we're going to put on press, uh, but then when we coat it, it's going to land where it needs to land. Right. Similarly, uh, that whole four-color, seven-color topic that we just spoke about at length, if you're going to build a profile for that, well, you a profile is a snapshot in time of a given print process. So therefore, your sheet that's being measured, if you're doing a G7 or a profile, better be coded the same way because you want to capture that effect. And again, Jason, well said. On that note, we'll go ahead and close out today's Gamut podcast. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with our listeners. Absolutely. I enjoyed it and uh, look forward to some time in the future. We can take it in another direction and cover another topic for our, our friends out there in podcast land. Absolutely. And if anyone has any questions or any suggestions for future topics uh, with our partners uh, there at X-Rate, please email me at jcollins at idealliance.org. That's jcollins at idealliance.org. And uh, maybe it'll turn into a podcast. Thanks for listening to the Gamut Podcast. If you have ideas, suggestions, or would like to join us or even sponsor future podcasts, simply email me at jcollins at idealliance.org. That's J-C-O-L-L-I-N-S at idealliance.org. Take care and have a productive day.